Hi, my name is Hassan. Today, me and my colleagues are talking about vasculitis, a disease with a simple name but a complex behavior to understand. So what is vasculitis? As the name implicates, it means the inflammation of blood vessels. And even though this can happen in arteries or veins, we are going to focus on vasculitis in the arteries because it is way more common. Vessels of any type in virtually any organ can be affected, but most vasculitides, which is broader for vasculitis, affect small vessels ranging in size from arterioles to capillaries to venules. Lymphangiinitis, which means the inflammation of lymphatic vessels, is also sometimes considered a type of vasculitis. Okay, now what causes vasculitis? Honestly, vasculitis can be either primary, which is a disease on its own and caused by maybe physical injury, chemical injury, mechanical trauma, radiation, or even toxins. Or the vasculitis may be secondary, in which vasculitis is secondary to a drug or medication such as amphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. Or secondary to autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, systemic lupus, erythromatosis, and scleroderma. Maybe secondary to malignancy such as blood cancers, and even secondary to infections such as hepatitis B, C, and HIV. The next question is, what is the mechanism or pathogenesis of vasculitis? Well, there are different types of vasculitis, which vary depending on how they are triggered and where in the body they cause problems. But the two most common pathogenic mechanisms are first, direct vascular invasion by infectious pathogen, and the second is immune-mediated inflammation, which is due to autoimmune disease where the immune system confuses a part of the normal body as a foreign invader. Sometimes the body confuses the innermost layer of the blood vessel, which is the endothelial layer, with a foreign pathogen and directly attacks it. To be a little bit more specific, the white blood cells of the immune system mix up the normal antigen on the endothelial cells within the antigen of the foreign invaders like bacteria, simply because they look similar and this is called molecular mimicry. Once the endothelium is damaged, almost all vasculitis diseases progress in a similar way. The damaged endothelium exposes the underlying collagen and tissue factor and these exposed materials increase the chance of blood coagulation. The blood vessel walls themselves get weaker as they are damaged, making aneurysms more likely. And as the vessel wall heals, it becomes harder and stiffer because fibrin is deposited into the vessel wall as a part of the healing process. So the possible outcomes of this pathogenesis could be ischemia due to occlusion, aneurysm, thrombi, fibrinoid necrosis, rupture, hemorrhage, and even infiltration of the vessel wall with inflammatory cells. What are the symptoms of vasculitis? The possible clinical manifestations are variable. Specific symptoms based on where in the body the vasculitis is occurring and which organ is supplied by that blood vessel. When vasculitis happens in those blood vessels, you get reduced blood flow to those organs, called organ ischemia which can happen in two ways. In the first, blood cells club onto the exposed tissue factor and collagen on the inside of the blood vessels, forming blood clots that can restrict blood flow. The second way is caused by the previously mentioned healing process of the blood vessel. As fibrin is deposited in the vessel wall, the vessel walls become thicker and bulge into the vessel, reducing the diameter of the vessel lumen and restricting blood flow. Besides findings related to the affected tissue, there are usually also signs and symptoms of systemic inflammation, such as fever, weight loss, myalgia, joint pain, fatigue. How is vasculitis classified? Well, ladies and gentlemen, there are 20 primary forms of vasculitis, and there are many classifications attempts to group them. Some classifications are according to vessel diameter, role of immune complexes, presence of specific autoantibodies, granuloma formation, organ specificity, and even population demographics. Here we decided to classify types of vasculitides according to vessel size or vessel diameter, 
into diseases that affect large, medium, and small arteries. My colleagues will take you on a journey to understand some of them. Omar will start with large vessel vasculitis. Now, let's take a look at some of the more specific conditions of vasculitis. My name is Omar Ali, and I will talk about the large vessel vasculitis. The two major categories of large vessel vasculitis are the giant cell arteritis and Takayasu arteritis. Starting with giant cell or temporal arteritis, which is the most common form of vasculitis in elderly. It is a chronic inflammatory disorder, typically with the granulomatous inflammation of large to small sized arteries, that principally affects the arteries in the head, especially the temporal arteries. It also affects the ophthalmic and vertebral arteries as well as the aorta. Pathogenesis of giant cell arteritis or GCA is likely a combination of environmental and genetic factors. Giant cell arteritis likely occurs as a result of T-cell mediated immune response against uncharacterized visible wall antigen and subsequent pro-inflammatory cytokines production, especially tumor necrosis factor. Anti-endothelial cell antibodies also contribute to the characteristic granulomatous inflammation and the formation of giant cells. Inflammatory cells, especially lymphocytes and eosinophils, can be seen invading tunica media, causing tunica media thickening and the lumen is narrowed due to tunica internal fibrosis. Now the clinical features. Giant cell arthritis is rare before the age of 50. Women are affected with this disease two to three times more commonly than men. Symptoms may be non-specific, including fever, fatigue, weight loss, and with progression, Symptoms can be described according to the artery involved. If the superficial temporal artery is involved, this results in facial pain or headache, most intense along the course of the artery. Ophthalmic artery involvement appears in about 50% of patients, ranging from diplopia to complete vision loss. Facial artery involvement leads to pain in the jaw during chewing. And in case of lingual artery involvement, this results in tongue pain, which is highly specific for GCA. If vertebral artery is affected, this initially presented with acute onset of vertigo and also associated with transient upper limb neurological findings. And we have to say that GCA is associated with polymalagia rheumatica. In fact, 15-30% to 30 of patients with this disease develops GCA. Now the morphology of GCA. There is segmental involvement of the affected artery. Arterial segments exhibit nodular intimal thickening and occasionally thrombosis that reduces the vessel diameter and causes distal ischemia. The majority of the lesions exhibit granulomatous inflammation and giant cell formation within the inner tunica media centered on the internal elastic membrane. As you can see in those slides, the giant cells, and in the other slide you can see the degenerated internal elastic lamina and active arthritis. In this slide, there is an inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes and macrophages with giant cells and also fragmentation of the internal elastic lamina. In the diagnosis, the blood test indicates elevated TSR levels, sometimes over 100 mm per hour, and C-reactive proteins also elevated, and by taking biopsy of the temporal artery. Treatment is done by giving corticosteroids like prednisolone. Now, I will talk about Takayasu arteritis, which is a granulomatous vasculitis of medium and large sized arteries very similar to giant cell arthritis except for two key differences. Usually affects women at childbearing age and typically the Asian people and it classically affects the aortic arch and the great vessels as you can see in those pictures leading to severe luminal narrowing of those vessels. It characterized mainly by ocular disturbances and marked weakening of pulses in the upper extremities. Hence it's called pulseless disease. Studies suggest that there are circulating immune complexes, but pathological significance unclear until now. Clinical features. Sinus symptoms usually are nonspecific, including fatigue, weight loss, and fever. With a progression, it may involve the aortic branches that supply the upper extremities, leading to weak or non-existing pulse, and the claudication of the upper extremities. Renal artery involvement occurs in about 60% of patients and lead to renal failure and or systemic hypertension. Pulmonary artery involvement lead to pulmonary hypertension and also the carotid and the vertebral arteries may be affected and the symptoms described as dizziness, a brief moment of unconsciousness, neurological defects and ocular disturbances, 
including visual field defects, retinal hemorrhage, and even total blindness. In the morphology, the histological picture ranging from adventitial mononuclear infiltrates to intense transmural, mononuclear, and granulomatous inflammation with the presence of giant cells. You can see in this slide that there is destruction and fibrosis of arterial media associated with mononuclear infiltrate and giant cells. The inflammation is also associated with irregular thickening of the vessel wall, intimal hyperplasia, and adventitial fibrosis. This picture demonstrates cross-section from right carotid artery. It shows marked intimal thickening and luminal narrowing. The white circles correspond to the original vessel wall. In the diagnosis, both ESR and C-reactive protein are elevated, also made by imaging studies of arteries such as X-ray, magnetic resonance angiography, CT angiography, or Doppler ultrasound. Those pictures on the right show the aortic arch angiogram. Treatment is done by giving corticosteroids, and also angioplasty can be useful as a surgical procedure. Thank you, and now my colleague Ahmed will continue. Hi everybody, medium vessel vasculitis with me, Ahmed Bassam, starting with polyarthritis nodosia, which is a rare disease that results from blood vessel inflammation causing injury to organ systems. The areas most commonly affected by this disease include the nerves, intestinal tract, heart, joints, and also affects kidney. This disease affects all ages. There are differences in the main symptoms between children and adults, but female and male are almost equally affected. This disease has a wide range of symptoms because many different organ systems may be involved. Patients may feel generally ill and fatigued have fever or have loss of appetite and weight. In this table, common symptoms in children and adults with pain according to frequency. In this picture, there is the acute phase of pain. There is a transmural mixed inflammatory infiltrate composed of neutrophils and mononuclear cell, frequently accompanied by fibrinoid necrosis and luminal thrombosis. Older lesion show fibrous thickening of the wall vessel. Extending to the adventitia, the diagnosis of pan is by biopsy and the treatment is by using high doses of corticosteroid. Now another one, thrombongitis obliterans, Berger disease, which is characterized by an inflammatory endarthritis that causes a prothrombotic state and subsequent vasoclusiform. The inflammatory process is initiated within the tunica intima. This disease typically affects a small and medium-sized vessel of limbs, and its pathogenesis is strongly associated with heavy use of tobacco. Patients show hypersensitivity to intradermally injected tobacco, increased cellular sensitivity to collagen type 1 and 3, also elevated serum anti-endothelial cell antibody, and impaired peripheral endothelium-dependent vasorelaxation. The symptoms of this disease usually start with pain in areas affected, followed by weakness. The symptoms include pain, open sores, inflamed veins, and pale fingers when in cold temperatures. The morphology in the early stages, mixed inflammatory infiltrate are accompanied by luminal thrombosis. Small micro abscesses occasionally rent by granulomatous inflammation. With time, thrombi can organize, they canalize, and eventually the artery and adjacent structure become encased in fibrous tissue. In this picture, the lumen is occluded by thrombus, containing a sterile abscess, and the vessel wall is infiltrated with leukocytes. Berger disease is a clinical diagnosis, meaning there is no specific test to determine if you have the disease. Treatment, there isn't cure for it. However, for improving symptoms and preventing its progression, there are many ways. Quieting smoking, avoiding cold weather, surgical procedure called a sympathectomy, also drinking plenty of fluid, and staying active. Now the last one, the disease of Angels, Kawasaki, is an acute febrile, usually self-limited of infancy and childhood, associated with an arthritis. The pathogenesis resulted from a delayed type hypersensitivity response against cross-reactive or newly uncovered vascular antigens. 
subsequent cytokines production and polyclonal B cell activation result in autoantibodies to endothelial cells and the smooth muscle cells that precipitate the vasculitis. Symptoms come on fast and show up in phases. The signs of the first phase include high fever, rash and peeling skin, irritated throat, mouth and lips, red eyes, swollen glands, strawberry tongue. The signs of the second phase include joint and belly pain, the stomach terrible such as diarrhea and vomiting, also peeling the skin on hands and feet. This disease can cause heart trouble 10 days to 2 weeks after symptoms start. Symptoms tend to go away slowly in the third phase. It might last as long as 8 weeks. The morphology resembles that seen in pen. There is a dense transmural inflammatory infiltrate, but fibrinal necrosis is usually less prominent than in pen. The vasculitis typically subsides spontaneously or in response to treatment, but aneurysm formation due to all damage may supervene. As with other arteritis, healing may be accompanied by the development of obstructive internal thickening. The epicardial vein in this picture contains blood and shows mild thickening of the wall, while the coronary artery shows almost complete occlusion by luminal myofibroblastic proliferation with a fine slit-like lumen. The diagnosis of this disease is by physical exam, EKG, so X-ray, and the principal goal of treatment is to prevent coronary artery aneurysms and other cardiac complications. The mainstay of the treatment are immunoglobuli intravenously and aspirin. And now, Azeddin is going to continue. I am Azuddin Saad and I will talk about the last topic in our seminar today which is a small vessel vasculitis. In the beginning we should know that many patients with vasculitis may have circulating antibody that react with the patients on neutrophils that called antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibody and the disease produced by this process is called ANCA associated vasculitis. So, in the following video, I will talk about the pathogenesis of ANCA-associated vasculitis in details. Pathogenesis of ANCA-associated vasculitis ANCA-associated vasculitis or AAV is a rare disorder that may affect many organs of the body by attacking the blood vessels, most often the smaller blood vessels. A hallmark of this vascular disease is the presence of pathogenic autoantibody called antineutrophy cytoplasmic antibodies or ANCAS. AAV often involves the blood vessels of the lungs and kidneys, but it can also cause damage to the blood vessels in the skin, eyes, and other vascular bits. The autoimmune response involves antigen-presenting cell, T-cell, neutrophil, and B-cell, which are the cells responsible for synthesizing ANCAS. However, the interplay of these cells is not fully understood. AAV, which can be life-threatening, is hypothesized to initially involve pathogenic interactions between neutrophils and endothelial cells. The precise sequence of steps leading to vascular damage has not been fully delineated. Activating events such as infections or exposure to other environmental stimuli causing pro-inflammatory cytokines to be secreted. These cytokines can prime neutrophils and induce migration of certain protein from granules within the neutrophils to the cell surface. Some of these proteins can serve as antigen for ANCAS. Interactions of ANCA with cell surface antigens and with the FC receptors further primes neutrophils. The conformations of neutrophils adhesion molecule changes, causing them to adhere to the endothelial cells. Reactive oxygen species, a proteolytic enzyme, and factors that activate the alternative complement pathway are released, causing damage to the endothelium and vascular wall. The ANCA-activated neutrophils release additional pro-inflammatory cytokines that recruit more neutrophils and other inflammatory cells. Monocyte, which can be activated by the same processes as neutrophils, can also contribute to the process by differentiating into macrophages. 
NK activated neutrophils and other inflammatory cells such as lymphocyte and monocyte infiltrate and destroy the visual wall. As the inflammatory and necrotizing process extend into the perivascular tissue, fibrin is formed by coagulation factors in the plasma. This produces the appearance of fibrinoid necrosis. Injury to the visual walls can result in localized hemorrhage. For example, extravasation of red blood cells may be associated with pulmonary hemorrhage or hematuria. So, ANCA are classified according to their antigen specificity into antiproteinase 3, in which proteinase 3 is a neutrophil granule and are associated with the granulomatosis with polyangitis, Wigner's granulomatosis, and antimyelopyroxidase, in which myelopyroxidase is a lysosomal granule and are associated with Church Strauss syndrome. In a small visual vasculitis, I will talk about the Wigner's granulomatosis and chalk citrus syndrome as an example. So now I will start with the granulomatosis with polyangitis or Wigner's granulomatosis. Wigner's granulomatosis is a systemic disease characterized by acute necrotizing granuloma. It is associated with the proteinase 3 ANCA. Affect the upper respiratory tract, lungs, kidneys can affect other organs but less common and usually occurs in the middle age. Clinical features and symptoms. A granulomatosis with polyangitis affect the nasopharynx causing chronic sinusitis, bloody mucus, and saddle nose deformity. In the lungs, it could cause a breathing difficulty and a bloody cough, while in the kidney, restricted blood flow to the glomeruli causes decreased urine flow, increased blood pressure. Patient with mild renal involvement may demonstrate only hematuria and proteinuria, while in severe disease, this may be progressive to renal failure. Moving to morphology, upper respiratory tract lesions range from granulomatous sinusitis to ulcerative lesion of the nose, palate, or pharynx. Lung findings also vary, ranging from diffuse parenchymal infiltrates to granulomatous nodules. In the picture marked by the letter A, there is multifocal necrotizing granulomatous with a surrounding fibroblasting proliferation. While in the picture marked by the letter B, multiple granuloma can coalesce to produce nodule with central cavitation. Diagnosis is made by a blood test that check for high level of C-reactive protein and ESR and elevated levels of ANC autoantibody in the blood while the treatment is by corticosteroid and cyclophosphamide, but relapse may occur that may lead to renal failure. Moving to the second disease, chalk citrus syndrome, is very similar to the granulomatosis with polyangitis but is associated with myelopyroxidase ANCA. Causes similar symptoms like sinusitis, kidney damage, lung damage, but it also causes GIT, skin, nerve, and heart damage like some medium visual vasculitis. Cardiac involvement is seen in 60% and is a major cause of morbidity and death. Also associated with asthma and allergic reaction, and the patients may have elevated level of eosinophil in the blood. So, elevated level of eosinophil in the blood, in addition to granuloma, can be used to differentiate it from polyarthritis, nodosa, and microscopic polyangitis. Finally, these are our references. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to write them in the comments below. In the end... Special thanks to our beloved inspirer, Dr. Zahra Marwan, for her help to make this seminar done.